All right, and we are live. Thanks for joining us tonight. We got Chris Hammond with us. He's from the FCS Fans Nation. Chris, how's it going, man? Oh, it's a fantastic Friday. How are you? Uh, I'm doing well as my uh, myself. How can people find you on the internet? Oh, man, uh, the good stuff. You can look me up on Twitter at Chris underscore P underscore Hammond. Um, otherwise, if you're on the FCS Fans Nation page, which if you aren't, you should be 14,000 FCS fans. Uh, it's good to join. Um, I'm usually on there, you know, talking smack to certain teams and backing <laughs> up uh, other teams. So uh, excited to be on. Talk talk a little McNeese, a, a program I'm surprisingly familiar with uh, because, you know, I am an Idaho Vandal. For those of you that don't know, we surprisingly have one of uh, our playoff history is a lot of you guys in northern Iowa. So uh, going back a few years, I'm very familiar with the Cowboys. Yeah, and I definitely wanted to bring that up before we talk about the Pokes. I, my first exposure to Idaho was the NCAA football game. Oh, and I, yeah. was like, I was like, I never heard of these guys. Let me play with them. And I was like, oh, my God, they played a dome? Yes. <laughs> so I had a few dynasties going with the Idaho Vandals. I think I think more national championships have been won on that game with the Idaho Vandals than the Alabama Crimson Tide. I'm just saying. Yes. And speaking of the Idaho Vandals, uh, you guys are in the Big Sky Conference. And versus sports, look. They ranked you guys the number two FCS conference. How do you feel about that? Uh, I mean, it, it seems fitting, right? Uh, I think if you took our three through our 12 and compared it with the Missouri Valley's three through their 12, uh, you know, I think we stack up pretty well. I think most teams would on our side might actually beat, you know, their respectives in the Missouri Valley. The issue is their one and two are better than our one and two. Uh, and that, and that's big. I mean, until North Dakota State starts losing consistently, the Missouri Valley is going to be one. It's it's kind of like Alabama in the SEC, right? Like right. some years the SEC gets a little bit maybe artificially boosted because Alabama is Alabama. And then you have your runs with like Georgia and Auburn, but typically they're the SEC because Alabama's in it and they keep winning titles. And before we move on, I got a big bone to pick with versus sports because they ranked the Southland number eight. <laughs> sitting at number six is the whack, which is absolutely crumbling in front of our eyes, but yet they're a better conference in the Southland. We'll yeah. The whack that. as also a former whack guy, I can say that it's not the first time I've watched the whack fall apart uh, live and in person. And, and I'm only 30 years old. So conference dying twice is kind of sad, but no, a hundred percent. I mean, you just watch what <laughs> you have teams pulling out a month, two months before the season, just going, nah, never mind. Um, it, it, I was talking about this in a, another show I was just doing with the Blue Buds pod. It's funny seeing how we watch the WAC go from like, oh, they're going to go FBS to like, man, all those teams might be going back to the Southland. Right. And yeah. apparently they don't even want to be a football conference anymore. They just want to focus on basketball. That's what I'm hearing. Which, to be fair, they were a good basketball conference to begin with. Grand Canyon, New Mexico State, like those are two solid. I mean, they were – in a good year, they were a two-bid mid-major conference, which is something that a lot of our FCS conferences can't boast, right? So um, if I was them, I would have stayed focused on basketball. They did really good at building them into a basketball uh, kind of like private -y. Yeah, oh, they were a great basketball conference. And, uh, you know, the, the perk with them is they are one of the three conferences that gets – they were a former FBS charter. That's kind of the appeal of the WAC over a conference like – the Southland or even the big sky um, is the fact that if you do have F FBS aspirations at the moment, unless you really want to sell your soul and go to the CUSA, uh, the wax is, is, was an enticing option. I would say it's slowly losing its enticiveness uh, as you lose your, your heavy hitter in Sam Houston. And then you have teams looking like they're bailing left and right. Right. We're talking with Chris Hammond. He's with the FCS Fans Nation crew. Make sure you search FCS Nation, uh, Fans Nation on Facebook. Join that group, like Chris said. Also, Q&A at the end of the show, so make sure you start dropping your comments. Let me come over here and hit the comments so we can make sure we see them when they come in. All right, so we're going to talk about McNeese State University, obviously. Oh, I don't know if that – welcome to the ranch, by the way. We just, we just changed the name of our group to the ranch, so – be excited about that. I, I like right. it. I, I was trying to figure that out when you got the invite. I was like, what? Is and I was like, oh, the ranch. That makes sense. Because that's your guys' uh, – you guys lean into that, right? Isn't that like the name of your student union building or something like that or your student section? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like where everybody hangs out, yeah. Yeah. 
got all the uh gotta keep it local yeah all right so one of the most exciting things that has happened to the poke um football program and probably i don't know a decade is the hiring of coach gary goff and you just Mm -hmm. released a video today ranking your 21 new fcs coaches and i was excited to see where you had coach goff yeah i had him in my two spot uh right behind ryan cardi of delaware so what does coach goff bring to the program uh i think he brings a ton of experience right um not so much at the FCS level, but he does have FCS experience with the Southland Conference uh, opponent of your guys' in, in Southern or Southeastern. I'm going to call him Sela. I don't care what they think. in Sela. <laughs> and uh, I think that's something that's big. You know, obviously it's Valdosta State is a, a power in its own respect. Uh, and seeing that he's able to build that and be able to lean into it. And I think you see that you guys had something like 15 or 16 transfers in. I think that's something where it, it's the benefit where he might have been talking to some of these guys when he's at Valdosta. It's kind of a new thing with the transfer portal, right? Like, even if you know you don't got a shot at, like, a dude who's going to go to Virginia Tech, you still talk to him, you still follow up with him because the way the transfer portal is now, you have that opportunity to follow up with them. And in a couple of years, if it's not working at their respective school, you have that relationship. And then I think when players are looking to transfer – I do more of the old school recruiting where it was like old school. It's like you went where your heart was or where you felt the most connection with the coaches. Or now it's like, where am I getting the most exposure? Who's going to make me the most NFL ready? Who's going to, and a lot of these guys are getting kicked in the teeth younger now and realizing like, yo, I I signed up at a school as a quarterback. They're recruiting three other quarterbacks in my class. Uh, Maybe I should go with who wants me, where I felt connected instead of, you know, chasing dreams of glory. I've always said it. If I was like a four-star guy, um, in Alabama and, you know, these NFL factories weren't offered me, I would much rather go to a school like a McNeese or even to put it in perspective, like, like a Georgia Southern or something like that, where you can make a name for yourself. Um, because I think that in the end, like I talk about Idaho all the time, Matt Linehan is not a top tier FBS quarterback that's ever played, but at Idaho, he's legendary, right? I think you could see a lot of that. I think that's something that golf brings to you guys is, being at a powerhouse like that, it got him in some doors at the level he was that he probably otherwise wouldn't have. Um, and I think that's what's helping you guys with with the the transfer portal in with a, lot, a little bit of out. And I think part of that too is you look at it and uh, it, it's really been helpful for your program in the sense that he also understands that he's not going to win consistently bringing in portal guys. He understands the importance of high school recruiting, but this is a – McNeese has had a couple seasons that are unacceptable for McNeese and to turn it around quickly and make the fans as, okay, we're getting back behind this program as possible, which like Charles is an area that needs some hope and needs this team to be good. Uh, I think he understood that. I expect you guys to see less transfers in the future. Um, So it's one thing I love is he hit the transfer portal. Well, he got some solid transfers in. You guys didn't lose too much out. And then, I mean, I'm a big Hal mummy guy. I mean, the air raid is something that, um, can win you a lot of games, especially at, at any level. I view it as it's a lot like the triple option, but it'll, it'll put a lot more butts in the seats. Like, yeah, we haven't seen an air raid team win a national title in a long, long, long time, if not ever. Same thing with the triple option. Like, yeah, people like to talk about Kennesaw State or the service academies or Georgia Southern, and that's great, but they don't win titles anymore. Nebraska back in the day, like that, the wing tee just does not work. But it'll win you games and it'll get you in the playoffs. I think the air raid is like that, but to a whole nother level where you look at what, like, how Mummy was able to do at New Mexico State with uh, Goff. You see what he was able to do at Kentucky, what Mike Leach has been able to do at Texas Tech, Wazoo, and what we expect to see here at Mississippi State in his third year. I think it is a system that can get you wins and get you nationally ranked. Um, And I think it has more potential to especially the way people are running it now like lincoln riley to get you further in the playoffs and possibly get to one of those national titles and why not Goff be the first air raid coach to win a national title at the division one level right like mcneese has all the powers the the gulf states are littered with recruits that can run that type of offense i think it's what attracted mike leach away from washington state um i i think there's a ton of potential with Goff 
and McNeese. And that's why he, he made my two spot. I put him ahead of our hire. I put him ahead of Jacksonville State, uh, hiring Rich Rodriguez, which has gotten a lot of flack from the Jacksonville State people. But I just I just love this hire. He, he's he's a guy that's younger. He has so much upside uh, and in a program that really you can come in and I think flip around pretty quick with the right systems and ideas. And in his first six or seven months on the job, I think he's done everything he needs to do to do that. Yeah. And, you know, look, I got to preface my next statement. I mean, no disrespect, because one of the coaches I'm going to talk about, his family's right up the road on I-10 in Welsh, so they may be <laughs> listening right now. But for the last six years, McNeese has had two coordinators with uh, being uh, Coach Gidry and Coach Gilbert and a position coach and Coach Wilson playing head coach. We finally got ourselves a head coach. And I saw in your video today, one of the things that you raved about Coach Goff is that, yeah, he's coming from smaller divisions, but he never got fired. He always just got promoted. Exactly. I mean, that's a big thing with the Rich Rodriguez hire. And I think Rich Rodriguez gets a lot of hate for um, reasons that aren't necessarily his fault. Like if you talk to West Virginia people, they love him, right? He was promoted from West Virginia. Michigan fires him. Arizona fires him. Um, but he's a coach that's never been fired. And I think that does say something. And it's why, yeah, I, I, I am defending my own, you know, video here, but it's like, yeah, I put Rich Rog at five, which I find it so funny that people are so upset. He's five. I'm like, guys, he's also been fired twice. Like all the coaches I ranked ahead of him have never been fired. And your guys' guy is the first guy that's been basically promoted as a head coach. Now his third time, everybody else has been like, yeah, they've had promotions at offensive coordinator and stuff like that. But yeah, Goff's never been fired. He's only climbed the ladder, and he's been under some amazing coaches uh, to learn systems. So I think he's a guy that's gotten the right amount of uh, wisdom and knowledge from his his time he has spent. Because he does have, for how young he is, like he's not the youngest coach on the list, but he's not by any means old. He's that perfect thing where he should be able to really take this program. If you guys are lucky, I mean, you guys could very well be his last stop, right? Like, uh, he's at that age where some P5, G5 teams might not take a chance on him in three, four, five years if he gets McNeese rolling again. He could be there until he decides to leave, which is one of the things I looked at, where Rich Rod is going to bounce at the first. Anyone that thinks he's staying at Jacksonville State, somewhere he has zero ties to, um, is crazy. Where Goff said in his thing, I'm here to stay. I want to be here. And I know that's coach speak most of the time, but like you can tell when coaches mean it and when coaches are just saying it. Um, it felt like he meant it. So it felt like he's excited. He knows the history of McNeese. It's a program where you can win. Uh, in one of my episodes, the Blue Blood podcast, uh, or where I ranked the Blue Bloods of college football, McNeese finished 18th all time and 15th out of like current FCS teams. And that's still including like James Madison and Sam Houston State. So like you take them out too. They're currently like a top 12 program uh in the fcs historically like this is a big time job this is one of the top jobs you can get at this level of football i think Goff gets that we're talking with chris hammond he is part of the fcs fans nation find him on facebook awesome group going on right there put your comments down below uh we're gonna have a q a at the end of the show now chris let's talk about transfers okay the um I guess the thing that most McNeese fans had in mind when uh, golf got the job was, oh boy, let's go look at Valdosta State's roster and let's see who's coming over, baby. And uh, we were quite disappointed in that. I mean, they got a great quarterback. They had three running backs that were a thousand yard running backs and they're staying at Valdosta to try to win themselves a championship. Why do you think we didn't see a lot more players come over to, uh, to McNeese to move up? You know, that's a tough question because I don't think it's necessarily a lack of inspiration or like uh, faith in golf, right? I know he didn't spend a ton of time at Valdosta. He is one of the multiple coaches that have kept that thing rolling. But uh, unfortunately for McNeese, at this point in time, right, uh, Valdosta State is, if you are not in it for glory, which I think a lot of players at the FCS, D2, D3, NAIA levels realize is like, there's only a handful of dudes going to the NFL. So like you're here and you got to really love where you're at. You've got to be wanting to win championships or compete at whatever you're viewing your level of success. If you're at Valdosta state, you probably had offers to some FCS schools. And you turned them down because you want to go win a championship. Just like we see when we get FBS type players at our level, right. That choose 
like a McNeese in Idaho or maybe more so North Dakota State, Montana, et cetera, over like the likes of a Wyoming or a, you know, any Mac school. Like if I'm getting recruited by Ball State or North Dakota State, you know, Ball State, somebody I'm interested in. So uh, I think part of that is right now Valdosta State is a national championship contender. Uh, McNeese is not. And to be fair, uh, that could be something where some of them are riding out or want to finish their graduation or whatever. These are still guys that, like we said, the transfer portal the way it is now with the lack of punishment. Um, this is something where a lot of these guys could come over next year if they don't like the new coach at Valdosta and be like, I'm going to McNeese with, with Goff. But I think your transfers in, you did do a good job at you know filling in that roster. I'm not sure if you need many of the Valdosta guys, to be honest. Yeah, there's quite a battle right now in fall camp for starting quarterback, and we have three FBS transfers. We have Cam Ransom from Georgia Southern. We have Walker Wood from Kentucky and Knox Kadem from Virginia Tech, and we put a poll up earlier this week about who the fans thought would be uh, the winner of the fall camp battle. Right now, 38% think Cam uh, Cam Ransom, 33% Walker Wood, and 27% Knox Kadem. Of course, Knox Kadem had that hand injury, so – he hasn't been playing that much, but, um, you know, who do you see of these three that could possibly come out as our signal caller week one? Yeah. You know, golf is less Mike Leachy and more Lincoln Riley in the sense of like, he has adjusted, um, the air raid to be more of a, a national contender than just a, a, a offense that can sneak up on teams, which is why I think a guy like Cam Ransom, Cam Ransom is so interesting because he is one of the top dual threat quarterbacks, uh, he, he's a three-star prospect, I believe, when he was recruited to Georgia Southern. Uh, obviously, he was going there under the pretenses that he'd be running that fun. I don't know if any of you guys watched Georgia Southern, but they were running a, a like spread triple option. Oh, wow. It was one of the craziest things you've ever seen. So they're basically running like a hurry-up triple option where they still were passing you know, about 40% of the time, so still not like a normal offense, but way – you know, more so than you wouldn't see in a normal triple option wing T type system. It was so much fun to watch. Now uh, coach ends up leaving. He's there. They have a really rough year last year. Um, and I think that's why you look at a guy like can ransom leaving, but this is a guy who had offers uh, not as many as, uh, as Knox Kadem, but uh, and I know Knox is a little bit more familiar with the system that's going to be ran, but I mean, I'm thinking if you guys are looking at upside, I think ransom's only a sophomore. So you got three years of him. Um, me going into it and like, I haven't seen any practice, right. You know, other than like a little bit of Twitter research before this, watching your guys' practice tapes and some post game interviews. Um, I just know from seeing cam ransom, which I haven't seen the other two guys outside of a few Twitter clips. Um, he's a guy I totally believe could lead any FCS program. Um, I mean, honestly, we got Jabori Gibbs at Idaho out of South Dakota state and cam ransom's a guy I honestly think could give literally beat win the Idaho job. Like that's how much I think, like, I think we have some talent on our roster here, but I, I think Cam Ransom's that guy. I, I think he could be huge for your guys' program. So, I mean, that's who me clubhouse leader for me, a guy I know I'm going to be comfortable with in a system like Goff's going to bring. Um, I think the upside for, for Ransom is tremendous. Yeah. I was watching some of his highlight videos on YouTube and of course our highlight videos, but yeah, Man, this it's kid, weird how everybody misses tackles on him, right? Yeah, he's this best kid ever. Is special man. He's got a cannon. He can run. He's not the fastest guy in the world, but he's not afraid to to hit you. And you know, he's down for his teammates too. One of the plays that mm -hmm. I saw, his running back was getting pulled down. He jumped over those guys to hit a defensive back who was coming in to make contact and grass back them. I was like, this guy's a football player, man. This is I one of those. Him. This is one of those where, like, when you're following Sam Herter of Hero Sports and he's releasing all these transfers in, and you just scroll down the list. Like, a couple of them catch your eye. Um, one that caught my eye was Can Ransom. Uh, like, as a guy who follows the FBS still, especially the Sun Belt and the Mountain West Conference, uh, that was a guy who's like, really, he's transferring. Like, Georgia Southern seems to be doing a lot to kind of change the tides over there. I, it, I would assume you'd want to stick around and be a part of that, but – you know, sometimes you don't like a system, don't you? Don't like the culture, you don't like the place. Um, Lake Charles is a hard place to hate. Where <laughs> you know, George Southern's a little, it, it, it's a different part of the country for sure. Um, so you know, maybe that's it. I believe he's from Louisiana, so 
Um, maybe a little bit of return at home. I, I was shocked to see that he was transferring. And if he was, he was transferring down um, as compared to like somewhere else in the around the FBS. I mean, I, I still think this is a G5 starting quarterback. Um, so I think it's a huge steal for McNeese. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because Lake Charles does have, have a lot to offer uh, for Coach Goff, you know, swaying some of these kids when he does go out on his next recruiting trail. Uh, hopefully he downplays uh, Category 5 Hurricanes because that would not be good. But, uh, man. Well, they're, they're once-in-a-million-year storms, right? And you guys got two of them. So, I hope so. You, know, you, sh- you should be good for at least two and a half million years now. <sighs> <laughs> if only man we're, we're still on pins and needles two years after hurricane laura but uh, i mean the we got great food we got great people you know the weather it does get hot but you know it's not anything extreme and a lot of good looking women down here too man yeah and it's not any hotter than you know you guys are going to re- recruit the gulf states a lot like it, right. it's it's no hotter in statesboro georgia than it is lake charles i mean Maybe it was slightly more humid being, you know, Louisiana, but yeah, all things considered, like weather isn't going to be huge for these guys. It, it's going to be atmosphere and cities. And I mean, McNeese is a great school um, and in an awesome part of the country. Uh, it's a huge selling point where, I mean, there, there are some schools that, you know, they have to rely on building fantastic facilities looking at Jones, uh, Jonesboro, Arkansas, like Ark State is, it, Jonesboro is a disgusting place. No offense to anybody from Jonesboro, but like Arkansas State has state-of-the-art facilities. That's how they win at that level. Like McNeese, Lake Charles is beautiful. I, I, the, if you're not going FBS and like, you know, yeah, you got like Tulane and you've got Southern, which is in Baton Rouge and everything, but it's like, there's a lot of really cool options down there, but like, if you're asking me would I rather play in Lake Charles, Louisiana, or like uh, San Marino or whatever, Texas State, like not even a question, or even like Mobile, Alabama, like I'll take Lake Charles. <laughs> yeah, right on. Hey, and another thing, um, you talk about Jonesboro, Arkansas. I actually lived there for a year, and that was the first time I had Corky's Barbecue. Have you ever ate at a Corky's Barbecue? I have not, and to be fair, I – I only know about Jonesboro, Arkansas. I had a couple of friends, you know, on the football team when we played in the old fun belt and they almost unanimously say that Jonesboro is their least favorite place that ever visited that in Monroe, Louisiana. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, they get tornadoes. Forget that. The tornadoes <laughs> scare the crap out of me, but that was also the first yeah, place where at least a second. hurricane you have like days to like prep right yeah tornadoes are like hey they're there there's the air raid sirens and you're like what hope i have a basement yeah when i was there two tornadoes rolled through uh marmaduke arkansas at the same time and wiped it off the planet and that was yeah, probably 50 miles away from jonesboro so it was a it was a pretty close one i was like all right we <laughs> we got to get out of here yeah you know the way like prices is and everything out west like it's crazy. And I keep saying, like, I went to the Indiana game in Bloomington this year. And I was like, man, I think a lot of people are going to start moving back to like the Midwest because it's just so much cheaper. You used to buy a house in Cleveland for like 100 grand, Indianapolis, 130 grand. And then I sat there, I'm like, ooh, but they're in Tornado Alley. Scratch that. But some of the Gulf is still affordable, man. I, maybe that's where the, where the move is, like Charles. <laughs> Yeah, I know a guy that grew up in Tulsa, and he was like, I'd take tornadoes over hurricanes any day. And I'm like, you're crazy, dude. Yeah, I, I'd rather be able to prepare uh, than it just rain. It'll give me like, I don't even know, what, three, four, or five minutes heads up. Like, you get a tornado warning, but like, I have a brother who lives in Texas. You get tornado warnings once a week almost, you know, in tornado season. And it's like, yeah. Yeah. So you're like, okay, yeah, it's like, cool. <laughs> they rarely ever touch down, but if they do touch down, it's like sirens and stuff going off and you've got minutes or seconds to like figure it out, get down below, grab anything you don't want blowing away. It's like, man, that's stressful. Like hurricanes, it's like, man, the way meteorology is these days, we see them coming from like a week out. Like you got time to board up, get out and yeah, it's a nuisance, but at least you can prep tornadoes are <sighs> different animal, man. Yeah. Speaking of hurricanes, Coach Goff and his staff hit the uh, transfer portal like hurricanes. Uh, I think 15 
new players from the transfer portal this year. Were you able to find any uh, people that you're excited to see play? Yeah. I mean, other than Cam Robinson, I think it's a big one, but you get a big 300 pound D tackle out of South Carolina and Will Rogers. I think that one's going to be interesting to see. I believe he was playing offensive line over there. So you're going to have to transition him uh, to D tackle. But um, I mean, anytime you get a 300 pounder that was at an SEC school, that's, that's huge. Right. I mean, not just metaphor or like physically, but you know, also metaphorically. Um, I think that's going to be a big one. And I think it's funny that you guys kind of did a trade there with Sam Houston and you guys lose a lot of defensive back depth outside the portal, but you're able to bring in Keyshawn Murray, who's a guy who has experience, has a national title ring to bring into the locker room and kind of go through the steps and help Goff explain to the current roster, like, yo, this is what it's going to take if you want to get the Frisco uh, and get one of these rings yourself. So I think you get a coach that gets it from being a champion at the lower levels and you have bringing a player now with that kind of that expertise and knowledge. I think that's huge. So if you're kind of asking me, I think the, Quarterbacks you brought in are huge because you got to replace Ogeron. Um, and then I think you get big D tackle and a defensive back uh, to kind of shore up that defense. I think that's going to be huge. Um, I know you guys got a couple wide receivers too. I'm a little – any skill position transfer, I know DB is a skill position, but they make me a little more hesitant to just like praise right away because how many of these guys you see that transfer in and don't even end up seeing snaps right and it's uh like idaho had a guy from new mexico transfer in and i think he played one game and caught like two passes in two years it's just uh sometimes these sbs skill position transfers um just don't work out so i tend to avoid pumping it i prefer to pump the brakes on any of them than pump them up so uh but i think on the defensive side I mean, getting a 300 pounder is huge especially with sec looks you can train him even remotely and maybe make that 300 pounds more of a uh, imposing 300 pounds and just a 300 pounds. Uh, I think that could be huge at, at you know, helping your guys' team make moves in the Southland conference, get kind of back up on your perch at the top. Yeah. And being that big, I mean, there's not too much for him to learn. It's just, Hey, we're going to put you in the zero technique. You're going to be right above the center Make sure the center and the guard has to block you every single time. <laughs> exactly. Your your goal is take two uh, two linemen so that your linebackers have clear alleys to see either read the quarterback's eyes or crash the run. Man, that that is his job is be so large and imposing that the guard and center have to team up on him, which means that there is only three other linemen to block, which hopefully frees up your linebackers to make plays. One of the uh... – Transfers I'm excited to see play is Marcus McElroy Jr. He's a running back from Colorado State. This guy's a bruiser. Six foot, yeah. 236. I watched some tape on him. Not only is he big and strong, but the guy has deceptive speed, too. He'll pull away from you. So I'm yeah. excited to see him in the running game. Yeah. This, see, the only scary part is if you want to talk about transfers, I mean, Sela brought in Kyle Edwards out of Alabama. Like, <laughs> that's a dude. He had almost every P5 team offering him. So, like, transfers around the Southland, like, that's a big one. But, like, and when you get Edwards out of Alabama, I don't know what happened there. Um, I don't think he was seeing much time, but he's still young. I think he's only a sophomore. So, I'm like, it, it's – the Southland is going to be a very interesting conference to watch, I think, in the coming seasons. I, I've kind of compared it in the past to the Big 12, and some people have hated this. I was trying to pump this notion that, yeah, we have the big three is what, you know, everybody calls it here at the FCS level. And I was saying like, you, you know, it's more of a power five, like what we had at the FBS level. And people are like, what? And I pulled up this whole statistic basically on how many teams have made the semifinals. And I was considering that like, you know, the big bowl games at the FBS level. And then so I'm like, it's literally like, this is, this is exactly like the big 12 is the Southland. And, the, I was even like, I think the Pac-12 is basically the big sky. And that basically it all worked because like, yeah, we got a team to the championship in Eastern, but they lost, which is like Oregon when they lost to Auburn. And it's like, um, I, I or Ohio State. And it's like, I feel like the Southland just didn't get, doesn't get the respect that it deserved. And now, you know, you lose Sam Houston, you lose Stephen F. Austin, basically the Texas Four. Um, it did set you guys back a bit, but I think one of the staples was, and the mistake of the whack, 
and a, a credit to the Louisiana schools is the Louisiana schools historically have been more of a stronghold in the, like the heart and soul of this conference than any of those teams ever were. So like McNeese, Nichols, and Southeastern, if you keep those three core together, like that's the equivalent of Stephen F. Austin and Sam Houston out of Texas. So you still have, you know, three of your five powers essentially from the Southland still there. I know Central Arkansas was on the up, but like when you think Southland, you think Louisiana usually. You don't think Sam Houston. You do because they won the title, but like before that, you didn't. So um, I, I think it's cool to see that the Louisiana schools are still there and still thriving. Yeah, what I was saying when all the Texas teams left and then we thought we were going to lose Incarnate Word and we didn't know Lamar was coming back uh, yet, I was like, let's go try to get Southern and Grambling and we're good. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine? Yeah. That would have been an awesome conference. Because I've said this for years and I wish this is what happened and maybe this is what will happen. Well, no, because Sam Houston and Jacksonville State are going. I was saying like the Ohio Valley has a couple too good of teams to be in the Ohio Valley, Jacksonville State specifically. Um, I was like, if you took like the top two or three teams of the Ohio Valley, threw them in the Southland, I think the Southland immediately became that fourth best conference. And then you have the SoCon sitting around there waiting to kind of recapture some of their former glory, which I do think will happen in time. And you do have five very strong conferences in the FCS with the Southland, the Big Sky, the Southern, uh, the CAA and the Missouri Valley Football Conference. I mean, I think at that point you have teams from all those conferences. Your all conferences are three to four to five bid, depending on the league. And then you we do have to deal with less of like when the Big South has Monmouth and Kennesaw, and they, you know, neither of them really make super deep runs into the playoffs. We're sitting there like, I don't want to be like a power struggle guy here, but it's like okay, but. The sixth place team in the Big Sky played a significantly tougher schedule than you, and I'm not saying you should miss the playoffs, but um, sometimes it's like, yeah, when you have two good programs in the Big South or two good programs in the Ohio Valley, and they wipe through the whole conference, and yeah, it's a little bit harder to say. Whereas, like, if the Southland could have captured that, maybe got like Kennesaw, UT Martin, and and Jacksonville State, right, or Austin P, and and put them in, I was like, I think that could have been huge. Um, which is basically what the A Sun is. So, like, how they basically did what the A Sun did on their own half. I mean, I think the Southland easily is ahead of the SOCON and probably at this point ahead of the CAA. And we're talking about the Southland is the third best conference in the in the FCS. And I still don't agree with versus, but they had them at what eight? I still have you guys probably fifth, fourth or fifth. Like, it, it, we'll see how the season goes. But man, I just. I think college, especially the FCS level, we'll see a big reset because, like I said, the WAC's probably going to die. Uh, and right now the the Big South and Ohio Valley are merging. So, like, we're already starting to see some, like, okay, all this stuff is happening. And the Southland just has, what, just turned 60? Like, yeah, too much history. Like, that's a conference you want to keep alive. You just need to get more teams in that care. And it's, and it's no offense to, like, you know, some of the teams that left, I don't even know why they left because they don't necessarily even thriving in this conference. Um, like, I know, like, once the Texas Four left, the other Texas schools are like, what about us? It's like, well, try. And I, I think the Southland has, like, Nichols is going to try. McNeese is going to try. Um, Southeastern is trying. Uh, I, I think it's a conference that could easily bounce back from this, where, like, the Ohio Valley is toast. So. Yeah, and, you know, <clears throat> when the uh, Texas teams left, they were – I guess I guess they thought it was really bad PR for the conference, and they were kicking the tires on like a rebrand. And one of the names I guess was the front runners was the Gulf Star Conference. And I'm like, bro, if they rename the Southland, which is a great name already, to the Gulf Star Conference, I may vomit. Yeah, I would. I would write your president and say we're leaving. Never mind. <laughs> like you don't you don't do that. That'd be like if the Big Sky, which is god dang what almost 80 years old something like that like i think it was four hundred sixty-eight, whatever uh so about 60 about the same time like if they all of a sudden were like we're gonna call ourselves the rocky mountain the premier rocky mountain conference right like you'd be like gross no like yeah. big sky is a great name southland is a great name like those are great names not great names the pioneer conference right <laughs> like 
Yeah. That's if you want to rebrand a conference, rebrand the pioneer. Like Southland is, I mean, that's a synonymous name, especially down in your guys' neck of the woods. Like yeah. that is the brand of football down there. You probably ask most people, like if you went to Dallas, Texas right now, and you asked, like, hey, where does Sam Houston State play? They'd probably still say the Southland. I don't think they know the WAC exists, right? Like the WAC is trying to be a thing down there, but like the Southland is what people know. You go to New Orleans, Houston, Dallas, like that's what people think of when they think of those big name schools, McNeese, they think Southland as basically the FCS level for the South, you know, South, West, South, the Gulf until you get to like SoCon country. Right. Yeah. But, uh, I, I would think it would be a tragedy if they, if they rebranded the Southland. Got a comment. Great show. Love it. Thank you. We're going to have a Q and a with Chris at the end of the show. So if you have any FCS questions, any McNeese questions you want to throw out to him, Go ahead and hit us up in the comment section. We'll read them at the end of the show. Again, we're talking with Chris Hammond. He's from the FCS Fans Nation. Look him up on Facebook and YouTube. They're doing a lot of great things. All right, so let's keep in line with the Southland. Let's go ahead and rank the Southland Conference. A little preseason rankage here where you think the teams lie at this point in time. So I strongly disagree with you guys as a media poll. Uh, I, yeah, that, that media poll every year is bunk and it pisses me off. So I, I don't think incarnate words can be good this year. And I think it's more than just Ward leaving, right? Like they lose most of their staff. They lose their starting quarterback. Um, I, I just don't see them finishing second. So my personal poll, I do have Southeastern bouncing back. Like I said, they bring in Edwards. Um, they've, they're going to find replacements, a quarterback. If not, they have the system. Uh, and I do think a lot of other teams are in a rebuilding state uh, where I think I'll give them that retool year to probably be better than the teams that are rebuilding a team that will be nipping at their kneels. I think will be nickels. Um, I actually have McNeese at third. I think you got, like I said, I think you guys brought in all the right pieces to really start turning the ship around quickly. Not this year. I don't think you guys win the conference, but like I said, you brought in, cam ransom who is young like that's three years of quarterback like you guys didn't just bring in a ton of grad transfers you brought in young dudes that can be in the system for a while and grow with golf in the system and it's going to pay you off in the long run where i mcneese next year could very well be preseason's number one depending on how they play out this season right uh then i do have incarnate word at four uh i actually think texas a&m commerce was a huge grab for the southland i think that has understated how uh, when we talk about D team, D two teams that move up, like this isn't a North Alabama, and it's not a shot at North Alabama because they do have a a pretty dang good fan base. But like Texas A and M Commerce could be that team their first year they're playoff eligible or literally a playoff eligible team. Like uh, North Alabama is not making the playoffs this year, where Tamu C has a shot. Uh, then I'm going Lamar and Houston Baptist, and really those two could just be, or sorry, uh, Lamar. Northwestern State and Houston Baptist because uh, I I'm just not a believer in Northwestern State, not a believer in Lamar and Houston Baptist has also just lost a lot. I mean, ever since Bailey Zappi left, they haven't even shown a pulse. I don't think they won a game last year, so I don't know what I would think that's going to make that change. So I got McNeese at third, Baptist at the bottom, and uh, unfortunately another repeat championship for Southeastern. And look, I'm going to be biased here because I'm an old school McNeese fan, but I tell you what, Northwestern is such a waste of a good logo, a good team name and a good color scheme. It's yeah. like some, some other team that just has a sucky logo and a sucky color scheme. They didn't need to go over there and steal it. <laughs> Eastern Washington. I just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but no, hundred percent. Talk about a Yeah. Talk about a program. Like we were saying with Southland who has programs that care, like, Talk about, like, I don't want to say sleeping giant, but a program that they like remotely put in a little bit of effort. Like, they have the pieces, but I don't know. It's that's one of those ones where if you guys ever did do a rebrand, I know they're, I, I believe they're a rival of your guys's, but yeah, uh, yeah, you could, you, Southland could probably do without them, which I know sucks. <laughs> you guys probably want them there for the rivalry, but as an outside perspective, like, Hey, a son or big South, like maybe you guys should look at them and you guys trade them for Kennesaw or something. <laughs> That'd be like, like a fantasy football trade where the guy always trades you like, uh, these terrible players for like Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. 
yeah, you're like, They'd hey. be like oh, oh, you'll give us them for a Kennesaw. Okay. <laughs> yeah, here's the deal. We're going to take Kennesaw from you, but we're also going to trim Northwestern State. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> the Big South might even be like, no, thank you. Give them yeah. a whack. <laughs> Now, and, and this may be a homer pick, but I got us going second in the Southland. And I look at this schedule, and I almost see us, crazy as it is, I almost see us going nine and two or eight and three. I see us losing to Montana State. I see us winning against Rice. And then my other games that are up in the air were Southeastern and Incarnate Word, because Lindsey Scott's an amazing quarterback, so mm-hmm. I'll never count that kid out. But... I, I don't think you're wrong. Like, this is definitely something that just comes down to. I just have more faith in Nichols being built. Um, I think McNeese is just going to have some of those growing pains, uh, which is what I why I put you guys at third. It's very close. I mean, if you just look at the all-conference teams, you both have five first-teamers. They have four, and you have two second-teamers. Now, Lamar and Texas A&M didn't have any because I, I don't know if it's because Lamar had made the announcement – after they had already picked the teams, I'm not sure, but um, well, Lamar's been playing in the whack. Yeah, although, but you'd think they would still be aware of their good players, right? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> like the fact that they didn't make any preseason team. I like I said, maybe they took the poll before they made the announcement they were coming back. I don't think but, they have any. Weren't they a zero and eleven? Yeah, I guess that's true. But even Houston Baptist got one first teamer and four second teamers, so. <laughs> and then like Texas and that like it just goes to show like preseason doesn't mean anything right like right yeah it looks good if you're southeastern Louisiana and you have seven first rounders and five second rounders but then you're like okay at the end of the season somebody from Texas A&M Commerce and somebody from Lamar will have an all-conference player I, I'll bet money on it now like they will have one stud lineman wide receiver punter that will make this roster um but so that's why I'm not trying to judge it too much on like first teamers but to show how close I think it is that like you and uh, McNeese and Nichols are extremely close in my opinion. I just think golf while building is probably going to have one more slip up than possibly Nichols. Precisely. All right. If you got any questions, go ahead and put them in the comments. We're getting close to the end of the show. We'll have a Q and a with Chris. All right. So let's talk about your national rankings. About two weeks ago, you guys ranked all 130 FCS teams. That was impressive, man. <laughs> so that's all Jamie Williams. I can't take credit for any of that. Um, he's a, He is a stats voter. He takes a lot of pride in it. One of the things that I love about Jamie Williams and his stats poll is he every, he won't do all 130 every week, but he does, I think, his top 35 every single week. He'll post it on Twitter. and he, So he'll show you and he'll like say, tell me why I'm wrong. And he'll explain why he put who, where, why, what, and why, right? Like, which is something you don't get a lot of. It's just like, yo, this random SID or, uh, you know, I'm not bagging on Craig Haley for how he picks people, right? But like whoever he picks, the, the representative from the Patriot League doesn't watch the Big Sky games and he votes, you know, two Patriot teams in the top 25 in Montana at like 20. And it's like, what? Like, how do you, but nobody ever sees it except Craig, where it's like this way, at least Jamie's like, here's my poll every week, critique me. And like he says, it's a great way for him to get educated because if he is egregiously wrong on something and a fan base like McNeese or Mississippi Valley State, whoever, right? Like if they pointed out to him, this is why you're wrong. This is why they should be higher. This is why they should be lower. And enough people say it and he does the research and it checks. It only helps his poll better. So that's why he does it. It's why this year he wanted to do all one through 130 uh, was to – kind of prove that like hey this is where i'm starting team so when i don't have your team at 25 on week five when i started you at 121 it's because you had a lot of ground to make up and five wins isn't just enough to do it but yeah i do know he he did have mcneese down there in the 60s 65 i believe yes and you know i think this plagues a lot of mcneese fans myself included uh especially in my age group in the 40s uh people who are 50s 60s um, man, we're used to a lot of winning seventies, eighties, nineties by God, like McNeese was in the FCS powerhouse. And even back when they were in the FBS or not FBS back in the day, but even when the Southland was a, um, a one, a conference, 
you know, McNeese went to the Independence Bowl a few times. It's like we're used to winning. And even though we haven't won since Viator left, Coach Viator, uh, we still every year, kind of like Dallas Cowboy fans, we're like, okay, this is the year. This is the year. We're going back to the playoffs and we're a problem. We may go to the national championship. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I've got to deal with this a little bit myself too, right? Like as, as an Idaho Vandal fan, similar, right? Like I mentioned, we had battles, I believe, in the playoffs, 92, 94, 95, um, our last couple of years before we decided to make the jump to go FBS. Like Idaho was a power program. The first ever one versus two in the regular season was Idaho versus Northern Iowa in the 90s. Um, so I, I feel your pain when, like, I'm watching my program go through a rough spell. And to your guys' defense, you guys have not had as long of a rough spell as Idaho. Um, I think where I'm – I'm not trying to put words in Jamie's mouth, but just somebody who knows him, right? Like, I think what he's doing here is he believes in a lot of these new coaches, um, especially Jason Eck. I know that for a fact, the Idaho coach. But, like, it's hard to – move somebody up too far from where they finish in the rankings based on just a new coaching hire. Right. Cause like it's not every day. Like it did happen at Sac state with Troy Taylor that a first year coach makes it just a transformational jump in the program in terms of win losses, not necessarily product on the field effort, all those main things, but you rarely see a team that wins wins four or five games go 10 and two. Um, that said, it does happen. Um, I, I wouldn't have had McNeese that low. Uh, I Spoiler alert, uh, I, I do uh, sleeper teams every year. I picked McNeese last year. They let me down. They were gonna <laughs> yes, be my, they did. Yeah, they were going to be my repeat pick this year. I, I actually have a lot of belief in McNeese. Um, so I, I have McNeese probably floating around my 40 mark, but I don't do a full 130 like he does. I do a 1 through 35, have my 10 teams loaded up to come into the top 25. Um, and McNeese was a team I flirted with putting in my, you know, 30 to 35 range. So for me, they're probably in my forties. I don't think they'd be in my fifties. Um, but I think what Jamie is seeing here is, yeah, just the fact that new coach, they do lose some talent. You guys lose a lot of your defensive backs, uh, including what, one of your star defenders to Marshall, I believe. Yeah. Um, so I, I think he's looking at that. Like you do have some significant losses out. I think you bring a lot of pieces in, but I think it's always easier to credit what goes out because you know what that production is at this level on that team than it is to guesstimate what the transfers in. Like if Ransom freaking is a Walter Payton finalist next year, then none of this matters. And that's the important thing to keep in mind here with the preseason polls is like preseason polls are a weird mixture of like trying to predict how the season finishes, but also trying to say who the actual best teams are. And then also trying to take all the offseason news of like transfers in, recruiting rankings, whatever. And just listen to Kirk Herbstreit today on the Pat McAfee show. He brought up this point about recruiting. And, you know, his dad looked at him when he got dropped off at Ohio State and said, like, your class is 25. If 13 of them end up playing football, it was a successful class. And he goes, whatever, like all 25 are going to play. And it's like, no, because due to injuries, transfers, dudes just want to give up football, failing out, whatever, like – Recruiting classes aren't even necessarily, you know, solid. You look at Portland State. Portland State is con consistently a top 10 recruiting class every single year. They recruit Portland and Southern Washington like crazy, which is a talent-rich area of the country, too, with almost zero competition. And they suck every year, right? So um, I think you got to take it for a grain of salt. It, it's, it's hard to place a team with a new coach who's historically good but been losing – uh, no matter what they bring in, because everything you bring in is hypothetical. Everything you lost has an output value. Yeah. And here's something that somebody said uh, to piggyback on what you said about the defensive backs, all DBs replaced are all conference players from other conferences. So they did a good job on that. You know Great. what? We would have, we probably would have won four more games last year. If it wasn't for our kicking game, it was so abysmal, man. I oh, mean, you got like, a new kicker too. <laughs> I'm surprised I have any hair left on my head. We couldn't even make extra points at one time. Like we had a girl kicking field goals at halftime. That was better than our collegiate football kickers. Hey, well, if, you guys hired, nuts. if you hired Mike Leach, they probably would have got a scholarship. <laughs> That's what everybody was saying. Sign her up. Let yeah. her kick. 
Hey, Sarah Fuller's doing it, right? I think that's her name, the girl from Vanderbilt. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? But uh, now we, <laughs> we posted a picture in the other group. Of course, we got the uh, transfer from Ohio State uh, at kicker yeah. now, and he Big made leg. a field goal, and you would have thought we all won the lottery. <laughs> hey, as a school who's been blessed with kickers, I never sleep on kickers. Uh, they're a huge part of the game. Punters even more so. Um, anytime you can fix that part. I mean, you see it all the time. Um, schools that, I mean, I've always laughed for years, like being a Vandal living in Boise, like Boise state blew two other opportunities to possibly be back when they were, you know, the sweetheart power five, uh, to really make an impression on people, but they refused to give scholarships to kickers. They only would have walk on kickers. They end up missing, uh, Brotsman misses one wide, right against Nevada and, against Colin Kaepernick in 2009 or 10. Uh, and then in 2011, uh, uh, Dan Goodell misses one wide left against TCU. And, you know, they end up not making a New Year's Six Bowl. And possibly th that one year was the year they were with Kellen Moore. They were looked at possibly being in the, in the national title game. And, you know, that's what a coach as good as Chris Peterson has been, you know, taking Washington to the nat college football playoff, Boise State, the Fiesta Bulls. Um, a guy who's still to about the – last day he coached did not think kicker was a position worth giving a scholarship to. Uh, and then you see programs that give them and you don't see those guys having those issues like Washington state, Mississippi state is one of those schools where Mike Leach isn't a guy who invests a lot in kickers. And then every year he seems to be complaining about his kickers. At some point you got to learn to invest in them. McNeese has got a big guy from Ohio state, a school that does care a lot about their kickers. Uh, that's why you don't hear a lot of Ohio State people complain like, oh, I can't believe we missed that kick or he pooched that punt. And um, I think it was his name. Oh, I don't remember. But, yeah, he didn't get too much time out of Ohio State. But, you know, the, he does have a huge leg. He was decently recruited out of high school. Um, his name is Garrison Smith, and he's still considered go. a freshman. So, yeah. Thank, thank you, COVID, apparently. Yeah, right. I was <laughs> – I had something else. I'm like, isn't it crazy? We talked about that. You know, this guy's been in the program longer, but then you think about it. And it's like, everybody's been in the program long at this point, if they're above a sophomore, but yeah. Um, no. So, I mean, I think getting a kicker is something you can never underestimate. I think the schools that appreciate it are the schools that you just don't have those moments um, where the kicker misses wide left as much. I mean, unless you're Florida state. Right. But uh, I think getting a kicker like that's important, especially after you guys experienced kicking woes last year. Um, I think you'll be much happier uh, having a dude that is at least sturdy. Like I've said, I don't necessarily want a dude who can make a 65 yard field goal. I just want a guy who's 98% from 45 and in like, yes, just don't miss a 38. Like I, I don't need fifties. I don't need sixties. I want you to maybe have the ability to do it, but I want to have to count on that. Like if, if it's end of the game and you miss a 52 yarder, I'm like, you know what? That's probably okay. But if it's end of the game and you shank a 32 yarder, then I'm like, what, what the hell is our program doing? Precisely. And that was our nightmare last season, <laughs> or well, at least two seasons. Was he on scholarship? I bet you, you might've found part of the problem, man. We had like four or five kickers, man. We had somebody come over that came with uh, coach Wilson from UTSA. And then, uh, then they had some kids they brought over from community colleges and uh, it was a train wreck. <laughs> no, hopefully you've solved it. I, I think I think so. If this kid stays healthy, he looks like the real deal. And we're having him for four years. So God bless him. All right, we're going to start our question and answer section right here with Chris. So if you got any uh, questions, he will answer them. Put them in the comments below. We'll start off with this one. Prediction for the opening game against Montana State. Ah. Uh. So, you know, hey, you're among friends. Be real. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, unfortunately, Montana State's going to be ready for this game, right? It's not like they're playing Valdosta State, right? Like somebody from a lower division that they can sleep through. Unfortunately for McNeese, they are a program that people are aware of. You're not going to get the Bobcats sleeping on that one. And correct me if I'm wrong, it's in Bozeman. Yes. Like, I, I just don't see that happening for the Cowboys. Uh, they return a lot. They return all all Big Sky quarterback. 
Uh, they return who should have been the Big Sky Offensive Player of the Year in Isaiah Alfonso. Although, to your guys' luck, he might not be healthy for that game. Um, Kai Okada comes back on the defensive side of the ball. So it, it's still a, a uh, Jeff Choate defense where they still have tons of pieces there, even though Vegan's working on the offense. That That's a that's a really tough one, week one, uh, especially when you're also going from sea level to elevation. So uh, the good news for you guys, it's probably going to be slightly cooler than it is in Lake Charles and significantly less humidity. So in terms of like your players being ready, like I, I've always wondered this um, and I've had some players talk about it at Idaho, which we're not a super high elevation, but we're like mid elevation. There is something to be said. A lot of people make up the whole elevation thing. The elevation adds elements like the kicking game and, you know, the ball does travel further, but it takes you a little bit of time to get used to that, right? Where there's something about playing in the swampiness of humidity that is a different ball game. Like this game yeah. in McNeese, I think we saw it a couple of years ago when Eastern Washington lost to what ended up being a very mediocre Jacksonville State team. And Eastern Washington ends up going on, having a great season, being, I believe, seated in the playoffs. Um, there's something to be said about a team traveling from elevation to like the Gulf is a lot harder than a team, I think, from the Gulf moving to elevation. So you all will probably see some issues like first quarter with balls over, you know, sailing higher, maybe a couple dudes looking more winded than normal. But uh, I think after they figure it out and kind of adjust, like I don't see any problems on that standpoint. It's just Montana State, I mean, this is a team that was just in the national title game and really only loses five or so pieces. So uh, I'm going to take the Bobcats in this one. Um, but yeah, that's, I, I, I think that's a tough one for golf to have as his first game, but props to you guys on schedule in that game. Cause that's the one thing I think the FCS needs to do better at is challenging themselves and not cha- like taking D2, D3, NAIA team. I don't think we should even be able to play NAIA. I think that's ridiculous in my opinion, but, uh, this is one where like, it's impressive that you're going to challenge yourselves and, and then take a shot at Bozeman like week one. That's big. Uh, and at an SCS standpoint, that's also a week where you get a lot of dudes like Idaho playing Wazoo or et cetera, uh, Eastern's playing Oregon. People will watch this game that care about the SCS because this is an FCS blue blood type program, a big name type program playing another big name type program. Like I believe in my blue bloods rankings, you guys were 15 and Montana state might've been 16. Like you guys are neck and neck in terms of like rec- brand recognizability at this level. And this is on paper a big matchup. So uh, I'm assuming week one, you'll have a lot of people tuning into it at least. So it'll be exciting to see what golf can do against vegan and the Bobcats. Speaking of NAIA, if anybody from the Southland's listening, uh, can we go ahead and invite Mary Harden Baylor to the Southland as well? Because that program, not only are their facilities top notch, like uh, those dudes bring the heat on the field. Such a good team. Here's a comment right here. If we have, I guess, anything on our side, Montana State has zero film on McNeese. Huge disadvantage. So I believe in this perspective a little bit when a coach is hired as an offensive coordinator or defensive coordinator to a to a head coaching role, specifically a defensive coordinator, because uh, they're probably not bringing in whoever the OC was with them, right? When you're a head coach, um, the system's going to be similar to Valdosta State. Like, there might be some minor tweaks, but I expect them to play a very similar game that, you know, golf has played the last two years. So they might not have film on McNeese, but I don't think, obviously, M- Vegan and his staff are well prepared. They just made the national title game. They aren't going to not watch Valdosta State and McNeese, and it being week one, they've had all spring and summer to watch all that film. This isn't where, like, you're catching them after a game, like week two, and they've been spending all year watching for week one. Like, they've had the whole offseason to watch all of Valdosta the last two years, and McNeese will probably last five. So they know every player that's probably been on this team, and they'll know all of Valdosta's things. And even that, going back to Chiffin, like, unfortunately golf has film on him. He's been a head coach for a while. Uh, he's not a guy who's getting his first knock at it, which is why I put him at two. Uh, you know, he's not a dude who's getting his, his first attempt at being a head coach. He's a guy who's been successfully head coach, two other stops. 
Vegan will have watched all of his film, I guarantee it, over the last three, four seasons, and all of McNeese's. So he'll have an idea of and a grade on every single player on McNeese's roster and probably bring in somebody familiar with the system and be like, hey, if you were inheriting this roster, who would you put where? Now, the defense will be something that will be interesting to see. But at the end of the day, defenses are slightly easier to scheme for because there's only a handful of systems you can run on the defensive side of the ball. And um, if you're just running a typical 3-4 or 4-3, <laughs> there's a lot less to prep for. So uh, I think zero film benefits you, but, I mean, I this if this spread is below 17, I might look at McNeese. Um, like I, I, I would put this as probably like a 10, probably a 14 to 17 point win for the Bobcats. Right on. And a guy you used to work with, John O'Connor, he's now living in Montana and he's the engineer for the uh, Bobcat radio station. So, and look, I know we're a new group and we don't have names for like our uh, group members. I, mean, I may coin it right now for all the ranch hands that are going up to the game in Bozeman. Just follow your nose because John O'Connor at their tailgate party is going to be cooking jambalaya and all oh, these fans are welcome. Yeah. Hey, I'll say if you, if you're looking at traveling, I'm a big fan of going to away games. I've been to, I was doing the math the other day since Idaho's returned to the big sky. The only schools I haven't made are Cal Poly, which we haven't played away. NAU, which is just the furthest I could possibly go in Northern Colorado. Cause I just don't see a point, but <laughs> uh, if you get the opportunity, you should be looking at going to Bozeman. Surprisingly, if you're worried about costs and everything, because it's the gateway to Yellowstone, it's airport is surprisingly large for the size of town. It is. Uh, you can get direct flights from most of the major, you know, hubs in the country because it is where most people fly into to go to Yellowstone. Yellowstone's 45 minutes away. So uh, it's a fun town. You get to see it in probably the best time of year, unless you really, really love skiing and snow. Uh, fall, September is perfect. because You still get that Montana hot summer. You know, you still get like the river runs through it. If you like fly fishing, anything like that, like it's a beautiful part of the country to be in that time of year uh and montana's got a lot of a lot of fun things to do and, and for you louisianans pretty similar stuff it's uh one of the more loose um, gambling law states in the country so every bar has like shake a day a little dice game you play Mo every bar actually has to buy your liquor license includes the ability to sell liquor as in like a liquor store sell like operate as a bar and operate gambling so they have you know, poker tops and all that stuff. It's a, it's a fun little town to go to. It's, it's kind of like, uh, Montana is basically the Northwest version of Louisiana. That's actually a great way to put it. Like, Dude, that's what I was fixing to say. It's just like home. Like Bozeman needs to be our sister uh, city. I don't know. I think uh, somewhere in Ohio is our sister st uh, city here in Lake Charles. We missed out on that. Yeah, it should be actually. Now I'm putting about the, you know, that's a, we got, uh, we got Wazoo that week. So I'm going to pass like, that is a game that would be fun to go to, to see in like, Montanans and Louisianans, which is something I want to ask you guys, like Cowboys. Like if you were asking me which team was the Cowboys, I'd guess the team from Montana. But uh, <laughs> right. it, it, it's a fun town. Like I always go to Butte for St. Patrick's Day every year, which is like this little known thing. It's a tiny town about halfway between Montana and Missou or Missoula and Bozeman. They apparently back in the day had the largest amount of Irish immigrants. They still have the most Irish people per capita in the United States. Oh, wow. They get they get rid of their open container laws. So it's a lot like, you know, Bourbon Street where it's just you walk down the street, you have a beer in your hand. The bars just bring up like ice cream trucks and are just selling beer on the street side. They do a parade. People drop off couches. So I always say it's like Mardi Gras, except in the snow because it's March in Montana. <laughs> and so it's usually snowing, which makes a whole nother element. But yeah, no, actually, I've never thought of that until like talking about this. Montana is a little the Louisiana, the Northwest. Yes. <laughs> So y'all should make the trip up there is what I'm saying. Uh, we were speaking about Lindsey Scott earlier. Somebody said, Lindsey Scott's not much. What is this, like his fourth team? <laughs> Why do you think a guy this talented just can't stick with a team? Ego? I mean, I don't know him personally, um, right? Like that's probably a better question for like a Brian McLaughlin or a Sam Herder type. But uh, from the outside looking in, if you're transferring that much, especially with not 
just system changes, right? Like if it's a new coach every year, sure. I think it's ego. Like you're not getting the ball too much or you think the roster isn't fit or like, I think it's something we see a lot with like Gen Z now is like everything's got to be instant, right? Like people don't want to stay around and wait. I, that's exactly where he is. Like Lindsay is just a dude who I think is just, you know, chasing the dragon in a sense. Like he's always trying to find the new high. Uh, I obviously hasn't found it in any of those scops. He's immensely talented, but uh, I would just guess it's ego. And, you know, sometimes ego prevails you like, Look at guys like Johnny Manziel and Baker Mayfield. Yeah, NFL questionable for now both of them. But, uh, man, it made them extremely electric in college to watch and two of the best quarterbacks to do it in the past decade. So uh, sometimes ego can be good at this level of football. So, But that would be my guess without meeting them. So I could be totally off on that. And, you know, maybe one day we can have them on my show. But uh, from the outside looking in, you just think you're above it all the time. It's my guess. Yeah. Johnny Menzel bringing his talents to the Zappers in the fan controlled football league. Hell yeah. Throwing it to T.O. <laughs> yeah. That's a dynamic duo right there. I, that's the most disruptive duo in all of college or all of football <laughs> history. <laughs> all right. Let's see here. Will the FCS title game stay in Frisco for the uh, foreseeable future? Uh, yes. It's, I believe they got a contract through at least 2025. So it just renewed, I believe, last season or two seasons ago maybe the year of COVID it was up. It got renewed. Um, yes. I think it's going to be there for you guys. I'd imagine that's kind of exciting. Cause how far is it from McNeese to Frisco? Like four hours. I cannot be for sure. Let me look this up. Yeah, Cause it's about 35, 40 minutes outside of Dallas. So, but that would be a five hour and 43 minute trip. So there you go. It's basically how long it takes for me to get, from Boise, Idaho to Moscow, Idaho to watch my own team play all their home games. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, no, but yeah, I think it's going to be Frisco for a while. I know a lot of people have considered it moving. Uh, I'm one of the proponents of keeping it there. Um, I've been every single year since we've been back in the FCS uh, as somebody who's been to bowl games. It reminds me a lot of like uh, it, more so than like the Idaho potato bowl or uh, for you guys, like the Gasparilla bowl, uh, it, it's more of like a mid-tier bowl, maybe like a pinstripe, or it, it gets a lot of hype. The people in those towns know it's coming. Uh, it's a lot of fun to go to. We tell everybody we've started Rainbow Row. Where we just have all these everybody, no matter their usually their team's not in it. We all wear our shirts, uh, and it's a lot of fun. So we've been telling people for years, like if you buy them, I think tickets are on sale. I think next week, um, you get them for like twenty bucks. You just make a trip out of it. You already know you're going, and then the hotel and everything is inexpensive. It's only expensive when you find out you're going and all the hotels are there, and then if North Dakota State loses, and then all their teams or all their fans are trying to sell their tickets for like double what they paid for them. But <laughs> uh, Frisco's a really fun place for it to be, man. I mean, I know it's been in places like Chattanooga. It used to travel around all the time. Hell, it used to be in Pocatello and Tacoma, Washington. And as a guy who's from the Northwest, like that's t those are terrible locations. Um, <laughs> Look, the DFW area is one of the easiest. It's middle of the country. They have two major airports. I recommend flying in the Dallas Love, not DFW. DFW is a shit show. Um, <laughs> but it's fun. The city of Frisco really does get up for it, including the surrounding areas like Plano and the Colony. So, like, yeah, it's not downtown Dallas, but, like, Frisco loves it. The It's in a soccer stadium, but they have the National Soccer Hall of Fame there. So it's actually kind of cool. It's this huge glass structure. and because of the way soccer works, the back, like the bar back or the backsplash of the bar is just glass to the locker room. So you get to watch the players, like basically like the Dallas Cowboys, you get to watch them like walking out of the tunnel, right? Oh, so nice. that's always cool. You're sitting there ordering your beer and like, you know, you're like, holy crap, that's Trey Lance, you know? So uh, Frisco's <laughs> a good spot for it. But yeah, it's in Frisco for, I believe, at least the next three seasons. But talks after that about should it go somewhere else? But the issue is Frisco keeps wanting it. It's hard to move it away because they do like this. Isn't just we're putting it there to put it there. That town really does get up for it, and so it'd be hard to actually pull them pull them away. I think because I mean I I love it. It's it's a great little spot to be. Yeah, the Frisco Fighters, the indoor football team over there, just got upset by the Quad City Steamwheelers uh, <laughs> in the playoffs. 
and like uh, Blake Sims, former uh, Alabama QB, yeah. plays for them. That's crazy. Yeah. Isn't it funny when these names recycle out? And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know who else used to play for them? Malik Ooh. Henry. Wow. Yeah. Really? The, the Q, or not QB1, uh, Last Chance U. Yeah. Spent at what, Florida State, Nevada, and you need to do one more stop. I don't know. Independence they, they, Community College. Basically, like Lindsey Scott is everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what was his issue? Ego. Mm hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so yeah I, pro frisco man if you're if you're a mcneese fan right now i'm saying here we are august 12th buy your ticket to frisco and buy your ticket to bozeman you'll have fun at both places if you were the deciding factor of where the game would be where would you place it um so i think there's a couple things you got to weigh into i do think middle of the country is important uh, I know maybe a little less so, but unfortunately for the rest of the country, the big sky is relevant. So you can't move it away from the West, even if there is only really like, what? I think there's 17 programs really out West, ah, more than that. But when you look at the 130 programs, we're maybe looking at 30 programs, 40 programs West of the Mississippi. A lot of them are East of the Mississippi. Um, so I get that like moving it closer to like, the Mississippi makes more sense than Texas, but I've thought of places like Kansas city, but like we don't have any FCS presence there. We're like, we've talked about the Southland, the WAC, uh, the SWAC. We have Texas schools, like people in Texas will drive to that with the addition of Tarleton state. Basically like we, we've got a home team essentially now, like uh, Frisco is, is pretty great. Um, I would love to see if we could ever get popular enough, getting it moved to like the Cotton Bowl. But, mm. you know, something historic like that, like if this game gets big and we can get more neutrals to just kind of go and enjoy it, uh, I think keeping it in DFW would be great. Uh, and like something like the Cotton Bowl, I think would be awesome. The issue is I just don't think we're ever going to get 70, 80,000 people to want to go to the game. Um, and Dallas in January is sketchy. I always make the joke, the, the first time I went, I got a sunburn every time since you see the rain or snowed. So I've always <laughs> joked like Miami would be great. Uh, I'd love to do something like that. Um, maybe moving the game from Frisco to the, the star, the indoor practice facility for the Cowboys, which I think still seats 20,000. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm just going to be Texas is a football crazy state, right? Like for me, it makes sense. Um, now, if we were doing like something like the college football playoff where we made it move every couple of years, like Birmingham, Alabama, I'd love to play in that new stadium, putting one in like Nashville, Tennessee, that could be fun. Um, I mean, you got to stick it to the South because the South is where football matters. Uh, the SEC gets a lot of flack for it, but it does mean more down there. Um, and I do think it would be cool to like host one in Wag Riz, right? Like for – Everybody who's never been to Washington Grizzly Stadium, like it's basically considered one of the coolest, not the coolest stadiums in the FCS and one of the loudest. Like, I think it'd be cool to like have NDSU playing like McNeese or somebody in that setting. The only issue is in January, it's definitely going to be snowing. So that's probably not happening. But I mean, we've always thrown this argument out about should it move? And then I would say like, where's a better place? Because I actually think Frisco is pretty dang perfect for it like i said i'd love if we could move to like the cotton bowl and have it somewhere historic the rose bowl but once again i, I think you're gonna have more issues with having people fly out west to la to do it in the rose bowl especially if the rose bowl dies but hey if the rose bowl does die that'd be a cool way to keep it alive though is move the fcs title there every year but i don't think you're going to be excited if you're like james madison you got to go from harrisonburg virginia and then let's say they're playing Sam Houston State. Like, I don't know how excited people are going to be to have to fly to Pasadena, but what do I know? Jacksonville, yeah. Florida would be a good one. Like, I think there's a lot of good ones in Florida. I don't really want to go to Orlando because Orlando's already – the issue with Orlando is, like, they already have Disneyland or Disney World, and, like, they have so much else going on, right? Just the benefit of Frisco is, like, they have a soccer team that's pretty subpar. They have an indoor football team that's okay. They have an – a double A AA or triple A baseball team, like they get up for this game. This is 
more people attend the FCS title game and they, the city gets more up for it than the actual Frisco Bowl, which is played in the star. So, like, we always talk to people. They go, oh, yeah, we had a bowl game here last week. We didn't put up any Eastern Michigan and Ball State stuff, right? Like, the people of Frisco love it. And I think that's something that, like, you got to keep in mind is, like, yeah, Orlando would be cool. But, like, the city of Orlando is going to revolve around Disney World. They're not going to give a rip that that game is in town. Uh, a city like Atlanta, like, that would be cool. But, like, Atlanta's not going to care. That's a huge city that gets so many sporting events. Indianapolis, like, any of those places where, like, the college football playoff or March Madness go, I think you immediately have to rule out because, like, we already are such a small fish that, like, it's nice for that one day a year to be the small fish in a big – or the big fish in a small pond, right? Like, right. for people that have never been, the people there know who are playing – and they are excited for the game. And you get people from Frisco that buy tickets and go. Like, they love it. And if we can find a city that could do that, I'd be down. I mean, I've never been to Jacksonville. I've always wanted to go. So, like, for me personally, like, yeah, there's a lot of cities I'd love for it to go. Like, I think Nashville would be fun. But once again, like, Nashville's not going to care. They're the music capital of the freaking country and the, what, leader for bachelorette parties in the country now over <laughs> Vegas, right? Like, Vegas would be cool, but – are we really going to have that much fun going to Vegas compared to like a place that wants us? And I think that's, what's important to think about when you're considering those options. Somebody says Minute Maid Park in Houston. I mean, that'd be a good one. I just also, we're already playing it in a, in a, a soccer stadium, but soccer stadiums are slightly larger than football stadiums where like baseball stadiums can be small. What was it? The pinstripe bowl a couple of years ago before they renovated Yankee stadium or whatever, they had a curved end zone. So each team actually had to play the ball to the same end zone. There was no flop to the field because you couldn't safely have people catching passes the other way. So there's some concerns about doing it in the baseball field. I know they've done some games in the Twins Park, and obviously they retrofitted the uh, Atlanta ballpark for Georgia State. But, um, yeah, Houston would be fun. Better weather than Dallas that time of year. But, man, I'm just saying, like, you're – all these options, I'm still trying to justify why they'd be better than Frisco. Look, yeah, somebody go. said, bring them to the hole. We can fit 17,000, baby. Hey, yeah, and gambling. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, a lot of the NFL football players come and gamble here, so that's an attraction. You might be able to see an NFL football player around. Yeah, I mean, I know, like, Lake Charles is what? Don't you guys have, like, two or three major casino resorts? Yeah, three. Yeah, so that, I, I know from – brother being in Dallas, like Charles is kind of even for people from Texas, like that's a destination spot. Like mm -hmm. people want to be there. Well, Chris, thank you so much for your time, man. You were fantastic. Look, if you want to check out Chris and the whole FCS fans nation, look them up on Facebook, join the group, look them up on YouTube, subscribe to their YouTube channel. Chris, where, the, where can they find you on the internet? Yeah. Chris underscore P underscore Hammond on Twitter. Uh, run, the football Chris show, which you can Google on all podcast things, except Apple. Cause Apple just is giving me one hell of a time with it. Uh, and then, yeah, every once in a while I'll be on the big kid show. And then uh, if you're interested in more big sky content, especially you guys playing Montana state here in just what, 21 days. Yes. Um, you know, uh, look for a soon to be announced podcast uh, launching on our network here soon. Nice. Oh, and before we leave, we got to give love. Yeah, somebody brought up in the metro sense of everything, five casinos because a little bit outside of Lake Charles in Vinton, you got uh, Delta Downs, and then a little bit outside Lake Charles, you got Cachada. Hey, that, you guys sold me. Let's let's take it. Championship <laughs> game with Charles. <laughs> yeah, man. All right, Chris, thank you so much for your time, man. We appreciate you. I'll see you guys next time.